multiple speakers today. So you'll have to just adjust that, that view for yourself, whatever you like most on your screen. I know we're all experts at this point. Um, we're all, we're going to have presentations for about an hour, and then we're hopefully going to have roughly 30 minutes of discussion. Um, and then, of course, there will be um, some email addresses, particularly mine and Maida's, for y'all to be able to send questions to if we didn't get to them um, or if, you know, you thought of something after the fact. Um, so first up, we've got April Bayham in the Zoom room, and she is with our Percent for Art program, and she's going to be monitoring the chat today. She's waving at y'all. And um, when we get to the Q&A portion, if there's something that we've missed or if there's something that she sees that people, you know, we haven't addressed, she'll be sure to holler that out. So don't feel like your question won't get seen. We're going to try and capture those as best we can, um, thanks to April's genius and fast typing fingers. Um, but first, I wanted to do a couple of short introductions today. Um, the Louisiana Division of the Arts recently had a new executive director named to our staff, and that's Susanna Johansson. So um, if you're on mute, we can just snap and say, welcome, Susanna. Um, also wanted to introduce, of course, the amazing Maida Owens with our Folk Life program. Um, she's in my upper left. I don't know where she is for y'all. Um, and she's gonna be the, uh, the main genius spearhead in this today. Um, we also have artist Monique Gardin with the United Home Nation. She's gonna be one of your speakers today. And we have Dr. Charbrion Plummer, who is an artist and researcher. She's gonna be sharing some thoughts with y'all today. And then we also have the executive director of the Center for Planning Excellence, Camille Manning Broom. She's going to be um, talking about receiving communities and resiliency today. So pumped about that. Um, speaking of Monique, you're also going to be seeing her artwork all throughout the presentation. So just wanted to have a quick shout out for that. And um, I'm going to ask Monique if she will acknowledge the land. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm here in Volbuncha. Uh, better known because it was rebranded as New Orleans about 300 years ago. Um, Bulbuncha meaning place of many languages and place of many tongues um, in the Choctaw Muscogee language that was um, spoken here in the territory at the end of the Mississippi River. Um, and just want to, yeah, acknowledge and give gratitude for all of my ancestors and all of your ancestors who've made it possible for us to be here today. And um, in my uh, sharing and in my practice, I've been trying to, you know, center a land acknowledgement, but I think it's also more important to center a river acknowledgement because here at the end of the Mississippi, if there was no river, there would be no land. So just gratitude. Um, to that mighty Mississippi that is very full right now um, as we are at flood stage. Um, so, but yes, if you know, the land that we stand upon was built by that river here in Bulbuncha. So um, also to recognize the indigenous peoples of this territory, the Homa, the Shiramacha, the Choctaw, the Biloxi, the Bayou Gula, the Shapatulus, the Washa, Shawasha, Atakapa, Ishak, Akola, Pisa, and many names of nations that I'm not mentioning and those that have been erased um, because they were never recorded in the documents of history. So um, much gratitude to be in conversation with all of you today. And um, yeah, the thunder beings are rumbling above us. Um, so I'll pass it back. Thank you so much, uh, Monique. Um, okay, so why we are here today, why you guys uh, joined this Zoom room uh, to talk about this timely topic. Um, this map actually shows the projected land loss in Louisiana. Um, a super important yeah. topic. Um, I'm gonna ask yeah. everybody to mute one more time because right we're getting some feedback. Okay. Okay. Um, so our goal here today is just to make the arts and cultural networks more aware of what's happening, what's already going on in the state. Um, if there isn't anything going on to start a conversation, if there is to keep it going, um, we want to help individuals and organizations consider how can they respond to this? Um, how can they become part of this coastal conversation that we know actually affects the entire state? Um, so we're not actually promoting adaptation strategies or encouraging people to leave or stay because we definitely don't have the answers, but we do want to start exploring all these issues together because it is a very complicated subject. Um, Maida has brought to my attention that scientists actually call a problem like this a wicked problem. That's the technical term for it. Um, it's 
super complex, super layered. And the only way that you can even approach a problem that's at a scale of this size is to be creative, to be cliche, and just to engage the right partners on the issues that the cultural sector has to be involved in because we are experts in things that only we know how to do, right? As artists, as artists, arts organizations, as arts policymakers, uh, creative place keepers, all of these different roles that we play in our communities. So first and foremost, we have to acknowledge that it's a statewide issue. Um, we also wanna point out that people that are here today in the room can be at very different stages of awareness about what this issue is. And um, you know, we're all in communities that are gonna be impacted in different ways across the state. Um, some have been dealing with this every day for years and some won't have this on their doorstep for many more years to come. Um, but today in the room, just wanted to mention that the audience does include artists. It does include arts and culture administrators. We have coastal programs administrators, environmentalists, um, and it's just really good to see y'all here. Maida. Hey, um, well, why now? Why are we addressing this now? Um, basically, culture needs to be included in the conversation about community resilience. How our cultures and traditions will be affected needs to be considered. So we're starting by preparing the arts and culture network to dialogue with policymakers and environmentalists. Uh, arts and folk life offer strategies to address these issues and can be part of the solution. I want to note today that I will share questions and statements about land loss and cultural processes for you to consider. We won't necessarily discuss each one. Um, big changes are coming. Uh, this map shows what will happen nationally as sea levels rise and the resulting migrations. The counties in blue along the coast will lose land to the ocean. The more land counties in, uh, the more inland counties in shades of red are counties that will see increased migration. The darker the red, the more migrants they will receive. I frequently think about what my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren wish, might wish that we have done. And this is really what's motivating me about a lot of this. Um, in 2005, after Hurricane Katrina, the Coastal Protection and Restoration Act known as CPRA was created to address the physical landscape and it is legislatively mandated and, and quite well funded. This is the agency that is building levees or getting them built and the recently announced diversion project to build up land using the Mississippi River. In 2019, Louisiana Strategic Adaptations for Future Environments known as LA Safe was published with the Foundation for Louisiana. It acknowledges that we have, we have an existential threat with the coast and climate change. Unlike um, CPRA, Louisiana SAFE is only partially funded for specific projects in Southeast Louisiana. Significantly, the LA SAFE report acknowledges the need to consider the human dimension. While the human dimension includes much more than arts and culture, such as mental health and land use, LA Safe does include goal five, which is to support healthy communities, regional culture, and recreational access to nature. It identifies the Department of Culture, Recreation, Tourism as the state agency to address this. Strategy two is to preserve and support Louisiana's culture and heritage, which would be addressed by the Office of Cultural Development. This agency includes the arts, historic preservation, archeology, span code of fill or, or French language preservation, and the Atchafalaya National Heritage Area. Of course, we're excited to be included. 
but goal five is not funded and the timeline is long term. I'm going to check to see, see if, um, take a quick look to see if anybody is in the waiting room. I don't think so. The Bayou Culture Collaborative grew out of conversations at the 2018 Louisiana Folklore Society annual meeting in Homa. In collaboration with the Louisiana Folklore Society and other organizations, we responded by starting this collaborative. With funding from the National Endowment for the Arts Folk Arts Partnership and the Division of the Arts, we fund two types of workshops. Since fall of 2018, we funded passing it on workshops, which enable a master to pass on a tradition. You see a collage of photographs from these workshops in one of the nine parishes on the coast. Some have been for adults and others have been for youth. They've ranged from one-on-one -on -one apprenticeships to small groups. The second type of workshop explores sense of place and loss. Those started out as full day in-person workshops for scientists, policy makers, and culture workers and tradition bearers to explore issues and get to know each other. You see photos from the first one in September 2019. We included artist-led activities and you see biologist Prosanta Shakbarti's and um, Brandon Ballinger's exhibit on biodiversity. The second one was scheduled for the first week of COVID lockdown, so it was canceled. Since COVID, we've shifted the focus to engaging the arts community since these could be effectively done through Zoom. Kelsey? Okay, Meta just shared two main resources and then some uh, main avenues of which she's been conducting some of her work in this vein. Um, but that kind of leads us to where you guys are in regards to all that. I know that y'all, some of y'all filled out a survey before you registered to, uh, for the conference, I mean, workshop, excuse me. And I really appreciate that because we got to see where you're coming from, not just the organization that you represent or your role, but what you feel about some of these topics. Um, top three parishes that responded were East Baton Rouge, uh, New Orleans and Lafayette followed closely by St. Tammany. 83% um, of you said that you weren't personally affected, but 20% of you said yes. And there was a little section where y'all could give us some insight into how you feel or, or you know, what you're thinking about this big topic. And there were two quotes that really stood out to me. Uh, one was not feeling that our land is stable gives me second thoughts. And I just really felt that was super poignant for this entire conversation today. And the second one was the loss of land is directly tied to the eroding of the culture. You know, when Maida and I were talking about these questions this week, early this week, one of them is, you know, what do you want your great grandchildren to know about your culture? And I was like, Maida, it's really more about what you want them to still be able to experience, right? Which is what that statement, the loss of land is directly tied to the eroding of our culture. That's, that's the fear, right? Is that the generations that come after us won't, they'll just learn about it in a book or they'll learn about it from stories from their elders. Um, so some of the questions that we asked y'all were, will you stay, will you move? Have you thought about it? Um, most of you said that you would stay. It was pretty evenly split between stay and being unsure. Um, and then interestingly enough, there was a pretty large organizational impact statistic where 60% of you said, no, you haven't been directly impacted, but that statistic flips with programming that you're doing. So. Kudos to y'all for, for having programming about something that you don't feel is currently impacting you, but that you know it will. Um, and then most importantly, I think the majority of the respondents were very interested in learning about receiving communities. I know that was a newer concept for me until a couple months ago, starting to think about different parts of the state. How will they receive folks that have to leave? because of the water, because of the change, because of the loss of land. Um, and so that kind of transitions us back into Meta. I'm asking you guys to mute just one more time, getting some feedback again. Okay. 
Okay, now we'll pass it to uh, Monique. Um, thanks. Um, so this map uh, is kind of a like, where are we? Um, and maybe folks who are more in the southwest part of the state are, are more in, uh, know this territory better than others. Um, but when Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005, I knew nothing really west of Homa. Um, and I found, suddenly found myself evacuated to Villeplat, um, which is, as uh, some might say, the northernmost point of Acadiana or northernmost point of South Louisiana, Buda and um, Smoke Me Capital of the World and, and, some, and some people's um, yeah, way of categorizing the world. Um, and I found myself at a, a crossroads or a, a cross, cr cross waterways at Arnoville, um, where the Bayou Teche and the Bayou Fusilier meet, which is all the Takapa Ishak territory. And, um, you know, we weren't going back home to uh, Bobancha, New Orleans, um, because the city was flooded for weeks um, and suddenly found ourselves in a, a new territory. Um, luckily, I had friends and connections in that place and that part of the world. But um, I, you know, stumbled across um, Arnoville just kind of in a sort of, yeah, a long drive. And um, maybe we can go to the next slide. Um, and at the time, I, uh, you know, was coming through, and this is in 2005, uh, we found ourselves at this little gas station at the exact crossroads, um, which is, as I was saying, um, an old Atakapa village and trading post. And, um, and there was Nunu's, which was a little art market and um, met George Marks and his mother and other community folks there at that point in time. And it was a real, um, in feeling so lost, suddenly I found a place that made me feel like I could find a sense of place and could make a home in. Um, and to this day, Nunu's has been a deep relationship that I treasure, um, that I've learned so much from and so many friendships have grown out of. And I think that, you know, in thinking about 2005, which seems like a long time ago, and we've had so many cycles of disasters that have happened ever since, um, Nunu's has always been a safe, like kind of neutral ground that I know I could always run to and I could have relationship and I could have community there. Um, and so in thinking about this sense of place, um, you know, I, I was remembering in uh, 2012, we came out with a documentary called My Louisiana Love. And at one point in the process, we met with a documentary filmmaker, documentary doc. It was essentially like a, a therapy session um, for this process of making this film about land loss and about facing um, environmental cycles of disaster. And um, she asked, what is one sentence that kind of sums up the film for you? And for me, what came out was when you lose your sense of place, your family is your home. And I think it's really important for us to remember that relationships um, are so core to how we respond. And, um, and I think New News has been this kind of beacon in Acadiana in so many ways um, that have been connecting with other community and trying to elevate and amplify. Um, next slide, please. Um, I also uh, want to speak to uh, Prairie des Femmes and, um, of course, my beautiful friend Ashley Michaud, um, who is an incredible linguist and cultural um, and plant uh, bearer in so many ways, and, um, and just to that lineage of the family um, and those folks that are able to be part of um, your network and support system and um, and helping to like question 
uh, what does it mean as we are in a state of um, and in a time of great change um, and how we adapt and how we find solidarity and serenity and um, and celebration also as well to remember that these are very dark times, but also there we live in a place that is challenged and also infinitely beautiful. And so um, Ashley has been doing incredible work just recently. Um, a year ago, came out with Omel Hus, which is a collaboration of um, of women who are working in francophone um, traditions and um, still telling stories. And Prairie des Femmes was uh, this place, um, or is this place between kind of Arnoville and Grand Coteau, which is said uh, there's legend that um, it was a place when uh, the men had to go to. To, to, to war or we're going out beyond um, the territory that that was a safe neutral space where women would go um, and, and found um, found uh, support and also um, were were in a kind of sovereign space. Uh, next slide please. And Ashley's work is amazing. So just to to follow that, um, she's on Instagram and um, just an incredible beautiful uh, human. Atelier de la Nature. Um, we uh, mentioned uh, Brandon Belanger earlier in the uh, presentation. So Brandon is an incredible artist, but also an ichthyologist. And, um, and uh, you know, our relationship, it was, of course, at New News, where we were introduced by George Marks. And um, our friendship and collaboration grew from there. So just to kind of think of these, um, you know, the constellation, right, of community. And um, Brandon is a really amazing um, human just and also decided to move to Louisiana with his family and his partner, Aurora. Um, and they are doing restoration and leading workshops and doing environmental education and um, creating space for community to learn and grow together um, in Acadiana. That's super inspiring. And so they have this art, science, food education um, that is now, um, you know, within the community. And his partner, um, Brandon's partner, is uh, originally from France. So that that kind of language. And just to say that, um, you know, I think it's important for us to remember that this is not the first time where folks are um, migrating and in, um, in in a state of transition. And um, in that, you know, South Louisiana, whether it's the Grand Derangement or um, folks fleeing from um, Saint Domingue, Haiti, and during the times of revolution, and coming here into the Louisiana Territory, um, that that um, yes, uh, these are are very kind of um, uncertain and vulnerable times. But also there is um, there's there's opportunity for us to um, to deepen connections and to learn and to grow with each other in ways that um, you know our imagination is not able to even conceive at this moment. But um, but that um, I think that it's important for us to remember um, that community connections, collaboration, and imagination. Um, and restoration in ways that are sustainable for um, for future generations um, is is something that we really need to kind of center um, ourselves in in finding solutions for the future. Thank you. Well, Monique's comments really uh, illustrate how important it's going to be for the arts network consider artists relocating and giving them the support so that they can continue working. Um, in Louisiana, the closer you are to the coast, the more aware you are of land loss and the more likely that you or someone you know has had to move. Louisiana and all the other large river deltas are feeling the effects sooner than other types of coast even though there are more and more news articles about displacement of communities due to climate change, much of the general public hasn't really been thinking about this. I wasn't until the floods of 2016. 
Geographers and planners, on the other hand, have been looking at this issue for quite a while. The graphic you see is from the research of geographer Matthew Hauer at Florida State University. He has done the most research into predicting where people will move due to sea level rise. Using big data, in this case, US tax return addresses, he projects where people will move. It's known that people tend to relocate to be closer to family or for jobs. And the changes in our tax return addresses help predict where people will move. You see the 10 states that will lose the most people. After Florida, Texas, New York, and California, Louisiana is fifth. And take note that the other states are considerably larger. Of those leaving Louisiana, he predicts the most popular destination is Texas. That's historic fact too. But most Louisianans will relocate within the state. They tend to move up watersheds to the next higher community. The first to leave are younger adults and middle class. Our population is aging. By 2035, it's predicted that 60% of Louisiana residents will be over 65 and most will be rural. We are one of the fastest aging states. The second graphic is also from Howard's research. It shows that Louisiana is second in the net loss of population, even though we have significantly less population. So what does all this mean for Louisiana? Louisiana has the highest rate of native born residents in the country. Terrebonne Parish has the highest rate in Louisiana, and it's also the parish with the most land loss. Many will relocate several times because they don't want to move too far from family and friends. Actually, many have already moved multiple times. The communities where they move are called receiver communities. Many are quite close to the coast and increasing in population. These include Homa and Thibodeau but they will eventually lose population too. Louisiana's history since European contract is one of migrations within the state and constantly adapting to the changing landscape of the Delta. Many residents are not aware of this. For example, there are many relic towns that have been abandoned in Louisiana. So this is not new, but the scale is increasing. Actually, all of human history is one of migrations. With migration, there will be culture change, but many aspects of culture are very resistant to change, for example, food ways. So our culture will survive, but some aspects, and they may be important to you, may change unless we make an intentional effort to not let that happen. So next you'll hear from a Charbriand Plummer. Thank you, Maida. Hi, everyone. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. Yep. Um, so as you heard a lot of folks say, and something that you know I definitely align with and have been thinking about as I've been brought in to share my thoughts about this work is this notion of sort of thinking of myself as a future ancestor. What what I want my grandchildren to know, or like Kelsey and Maida were saying, to have experience. Um, and so keeping that front of mind, the biggest thing for me is that I know that I always want to find ways to center the stories and the challenges of the communities that I'm a part of and to find ways to creatively problem solve. Um, and so for me, when thinking about land loss and climate change, um, one of the sort of biggest points that I thought needed to be discussed among many others is this need to take on an intersectional viewpoint. Um, so Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw was the person who initially coined the term intersectionality. It's something that's sort of existed and been present, but she really helped to give it voice. And intersectionality, if you don't know, is the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender. Um, and they're regarded as creating these sort of overlapping and interdependent systems of oppression or disadvantage. So I'm just gonna share a few things about how this is connected to land loss. Um, drawing on some scholarship, collective scholarship of Dean Hardy, Richard Milligan, and Nick Hainan. Um, so to the first point, how is this connected to land loss? So it's no secret that many of our coastal communities are in a vulnerable state. You saw the map that Maida had. 
um, because of climate change. And so what I'm asking for uh, us to consider is that we are doing ourselves a disservice if our analysis of environmental shifts and climate change don't have an accompanying critical race analysis to help us identify the unevenness um, or inequities within those vulnerabilities that we are facing within our geographic communities. Um, and so one way to sort of do this is to look at the history um, that shows the correlation between land settlement and racialized projects or how like race has been constructed and developed and thus how treat people have been treated um, as a result of that. So there were a lot of social and political processes along the Southern US coast that historically dispossessed racial minorities through land grabbing um, and other inequitable practices. And so this dispossession and forced movement ultimately impacts how people are viewed or defined as products of broader social, political, um, and cultural forces, et cetera. So how we even come to understand race and its cultural byproducts and thinking about arts and culture are iterations of what once was because of how folks migrated, forced or otherwise, and adapted or possibly didn't survive. So if we know that race and all these identities are always in formation, then Black and other non-white groups, um, our vulnerability to sea level rise is also always in formation within these coastal regions in terms of how we might need to adapt or have adapt histor adapted historically over time. Um, so one of the things, I like how Laura Polito frames this, she looks at the history of land and, and really calls for um, a, a necessary analysis of this if we're looking at climate change because she states that sea level rise is not the inundation of neutral land, but that the land facing inundation is racialized land and that land has been appropriated, settled, cultivated and distributed through a long history of racialization. Um, another thing that I came that came up for me as I was reading and really starting to educate myself is that there is um, a greater need and a consist consistent and continued need for equity around language and decision making. Um, so that means utilizing and educating oneself on distinguishing terms such as environmental racism or climate gap. Um, so Jean Christophe Gaillard says that by overlooking everyday life in climate change adaptation, we are participating in the development of a climate gap or the gap between the large amount of attention given to climate change on an international or national scale, and then the everyday concerns of vulnerable communities. So spaces like the one we're in today are those uh, sort of incubators or areas where we can start to do that level of like deep looking into everyday vulnerability. Um, and it also means taking time to like have conversations around how folks of color have been disproportionately affected from environmental hazards that might include toxic substance release, water quality, et cetera. Um, but also one thing that has become really big for me, and if you work in the arts, um, I know oftentimes it's very easy to say, well, it's like, this is a very liberatory space. Arts and culture help us to feel liberated and free, et cetera, but we can't allow colorblindness to inform how we might position ourselves as receiver communities or our discussions of migration and adaptation. Um, so colorblindness doesn't allow us to be honest about the limitations or reputations or perceptions that we might face um, as within our geographic location. So for example, you might feel like, well, we serve everyone, we welcome everyone, um, but if somebody is leaving a traumatic situation, it's important to confront the blind spots that you might have about your own institution, city, neighborhood, et cetera, um, because there may be challenges or an opportunity to build trust with someone who's relocating to an area that they may not necessarily feel welcome in, or they're trying to you know, gather their footing and figure out where do I belong? Um, it's important to remember that we don't operate in a vacuum and we should continue to ask ourselves how our organization is embedded within the place that we call home. So while you may have a working knowledge of your area, someone new to that place won't. So how do we grapple with um, the points in which we might overlap in terms of how we're perceived and how others perceive us and then where we, we sort of deviate from that. And then lastly, how are we centering multiple knowledges and experiences? So as we continue conversations like the one today, who's at the forefront of that? If you want to replicate something like this in your own life, um, based on what you know about the history of place or home, what are you doing or what can you do to ensure that history doesn't repeat itself? Um, what needs to happen in terms of moving resources, ideas or people, et cetera, um, in order to center environmental justice while navigating the uncertainty of climate change. And then more importantly, 
Uh, how can arts and culture honor what is lost or that which is past and creatively address what's to come? So we can go to the next slide, Mia. Thank you. And so this slide, I just, whenever I was doing my research, I came across um, this slide and it just so happened that it kind of mirrored the one that made I had. And I was like, oh, this is super interesting. Um, so it actually shows uh, the population, the black population in coastal counties of the contiguous US. Um, so the map essentially shows that the percentage of black folks um, are above the national average of 13.6% indicated by those dark gray counties and areas. So if we're thinking about movement, race, people, place, et cetera, um, should these areas, those sort of dark areas cease to exist, what happens to their residents, their cultural landscapes and their memories? Um, where do these folks go and, and how does life become altered once they settle elsewhere? And what do the iterations you know, of life and the cultural byproducts look like when they exist in a different space? And how do we sort of set ourselves up to make sure that they don't get swallowed or lost um, when this time comes. Thank you. You see it now? Yeah, and so if you go to number two. Yeah, there we go, okay. Um, first, I'm just gonna tell you really quickly a little bit about my organization, Center for Planning Excellence. Uh, as the mis mission suggests, much of what we do is about setting the table and bringing diverse stakeholders, experts, elected officials, community leaders uh, together to set and pursue a vision. And the focus areas listed here describe the lens in which we view our work and the goals we set for ourselves, but it's important to note that they are not separate endeavors. Um, uh, all of these things are interconnected as, as we've discussed and, and go hand in hand to make great communities. The next slide. Um, I'd like to just make sure we're on the same play, page when I describe planning. Um, a lot of times, when, or, or right after Katrina and Rita, when I started going into the coastal communities, uh, discussing planning for the first time, um, many people thought we were, we were talking about event planning. Uh, and that just goes to um, the, the nature and culture of which in Louisiana, we, we've been a high private property rights state and uh, haven't done a lot of, of planning. Um, actually, when Katrina and Rita hit in 2005, only 15 out of our 64 parishes had master plans uh, where you know, they were setting the table, developing a vision and, and a roadmap on how to get there. And so planning is a technical and it's a political process that's concerned with the development and design of land use and the built environment, including air, water, and the infrastructure passing in and out of urban areas and such as you know, transportation, communications, distribution networks. Uh, urban planning deals with the physical layout of human settlements and the primary concern is public welfare, uh, which includes considerations of efficiency, sanitation, protection, use of the environment, uh, as well as effects on social and economic activities. Uh, it's considered a interdisciplinary field that includes uh, not only social science, but also engineering and design sciences. So in a nutshell, it's the study of the built environment of a city, town, or other area. Um, next slide. And the reason why design is so important is that we, 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 we see what, what our decisions uh, accumulate to. And so on the left, you know, you can see anywhere USA, and on the right, you can see a place where there were intentional um, ordinances and, and design thought that went into uh, how that built environment um, was developed. Next slide. Uh, we really got our start after Katrina and Rita. Um, that was, you know, the majority of, of individuals in my office um, moved back home to Louisiana after Katrina and Rita. It was the first time that uh, a lot of landscape architects and planners um, had a real call to action. Our vulnerabilities were exposed. And so we've, we've worked in over 50 communities across the state. We work at many scales. Um, it, planning should and, and um, can occur at multiple scales. For example, regional plans should be concerned with uh, regional transportation networks, 
regional economic development trends and opportunities and large scale environmental features such as watersheds. But a neighborhood plan is gonna be concerned with smaller scale features such as intersections and sidewalks and green spaces and design standards. Uh, the important thing is that different plans at different scales are coordinated with one another in order to streamline implementation and avoid cross purposes. Next slide. Um, so uh, Maida showed you the land loss uh, slide, but th this is something that we mapped and developed during the LA safe planning process where we coupled not only the modeling around sea level rise, but also the model modeling around flooding in our watersheds. And so you can see when these things are coupled, it's, it's a much graver risk uh, that we're posed with um, given our very fragile, um, our, our fragile environmental situation, not just uh, along the coast, but, but it goes all the way up uh, throughout the state. Um, places in North Louisiana, are, are, are dealing with um, the cyclical nature of not only droughts and, and farmers are experiencing droughts um, pretty heavily right now, but then, then after a long period of drought, we have these very high heavy rains and um, they, there's no time to seep into the ground there. It's, it's, you know, they're hitting such a hard surface. And so um, the, the flooding impacts that we can expect in the future uh, for the state are pretty dire. And so uh, the, the state is working on a Louisiana watershed initiative where we're gonna have the first mapping to understand the watersheds across Louisiana and what's happening there. Next slide. So the point I, I, um, I wanna just add on to Nada's um, um, description around uh, migration. What we're seeing right now is we're experiencing a means-based adaptation. So those that are able to adapt do, and those that cannot are being left behind. And so this is the same with the resources we see coming in from the government adaptation funds are typically one-time grants or disaster dollars. And so the most at-risk residents and communities do not have the means to organize for support. There's a loss of voice that goes with the loss of community that makes it harder and harder. And then the question becomes, and if they did have a voice, who is responsible? There's no one elected official or various government that's purely responsible with figuring out this very highly complex situation we find ourselves in. Everyone ends up pointing to somebody else. And so we've, witten that we've witnessed this uh, firsthand here. As Nada mentioned, next slide, um, you know, people are also leaving Louisiana. I think what, what causes me a lot of concern is that it, it's, not, it's not the people leaving the high risk areas. It's also people leaving and planning for their children to leave even the, what we would maybe consider as the receiving communities. And so the CitySats survey um, conducted in 29 found that um, um, parents in the East Baton Rouge parish want their children to leave and only less than 10%, um, only less than 10% want them to live in East Baton Rouge Parish. That, that's highly concerning. It's, um, and, and the reality is, and, and I know, you know, many people uh, with young children, um, their, their children are told from a young age, you know, you're going to be going away for college, you're not going to be staying here. And so I think we've got some pretty big challenges ahead of us on the migration front. All right, so I was asked to talk to you about, next slide, Maida, please. Um, what do we need to do? Uh, so we've got these big climate change factors. We have massive economic shifts occurring. Uh, what is it that we can do to um, be able to not only grow in the future, but, but, but thrive? Um, one thing is we've got to focus on mitigation. This is slowing the negative environmental changes by you know, reducing the, the, the um, horrible um, um, emissions that are occurring to, to increase temperatures globally. 
Um, and then we've got to adapt. We've got to make the changes that enable people and communities to thrive amidst these environmental changes. And so these are not mutually con con exclusive. They are absolutely both necessary. Next slide. I won't go into this, but the biggest is to approach on mitigation. Louisiana is a high carbon intense economy and the globe is moving to uh, a low carbon economy. And so uh, we, we should expect a lot of fluctuation in um, the, the mainstays of, of our um, economy in terms of oil, gas, and petrochemical. Um, we don't know what the, the shift is gonna look like, but um, it's absolutely going to happen. Next slide. And then what I'm really going to focus on today are the approaches for adaptation. This is what CPAC does with communities and, and the state. Um, it's focusing on resilient infrastructure, water management, and then from the design perspective, low growth and low impact development. Next slide. So the first, um, Nada asked me to talk to you a little bit about adapting to these changes and, and the LA Safe initiative. Um, and, and this is just a, a rendering, I'll, I'll move on to the next slide. So this was a really challenging task. We went into six parishes uh, led by the state of Louisiana, the Office of Community Development. We were, we were hired as planners to help to draft the plans and, and work with the communities. But for the first time, the state was going out and conducting large workshops um, really outlining the risk to communities, telling you know, the, the really hard story and hard truths about what was happening. And we essentially through countless uh, public meetings did a lot of crowdsourcing of ideas to develop these adaptation plans where we focused on with the 50 year vision of a very high rate risk place versus a medium risk and a low place uh, risk look like. Uh, this is the, the higher risk area. So we could see, you know, a movement from um, a working coast to a more recreational coast. Next slide. That, that can withstand the water um, to a place that's kind of in between, definitely has a great relationship with water, but, but you know, really has to rethink its infrastructure, nature-based solutions and such. Next slide. And then in the, the lower risk areas, we've got to focus on, you know, what is it that the What's going to attract people uh, to this place? What's going to keep them here? And then when they get here, what kind of networks are we going to need? Um, how do we make a transition? Um, you know, where for the first time we're we're talking about let's capture increased population and build the communities that uh, really tell a story, are focused on quality of life, um, character, sense of place. And so um, I, I know that we're running out of time and Maida, I want to check with you on time because I, I know that you wanted to have a Q&A. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to go talk for an hour and discuss for an hour, present for an oh, hour. Oh, okay. 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 Um, and so I encourage you all to, to check out the plan if you want to know more details. Um, but you know, this is, is really creating a more compact development style that has a, a good relationship with water and the natural environment, enhances access and mobility uh, with choices to housing, choices to uh, transit, and um, everyone, you know, lots of green space and, and things of, of which you know, we would want to design our communities. Next slide. And then um, I just wanted to add that I think this is, this is uh, critical. We, um, Center for Planning Excellence, worked with the governor and the governor's office to put on a workshop in August, uh, October of 2018. We brought the, the governor, the cabinet, and the sub-cabinet together and facilitated a two-day workshop walking through what climate change looks like in the state of Louisiana. Um, to, you know, what, is, what are the policies, what, what's ahead of us, and how, how can we get everyone involved, and, and seeking opportunity in this. And next slide. Uh, and, and yeah, it was really fun, because we, we had everybody, um, and, you know, showing off their artistic skills, <laughs> and, and drawing images, and, and um, really trying to tell the narrative of, of Louisiana and the future. Next slide. But at the end of the day, I think, um, and, and this, is, this is also um, 
you know, supported in uh, academic literature. When we look at the climate risk ahead of us, uh, and we think about the scenarios in which um, you know we can we're working with this. We we've in this sorry this slide we we went through an activity to outline four different scenarios. And so on one hand, you've got you know the extreme worst climate impacts, and then on the other hand, you still have bad impacts. It's just not as bad as seven you know seven meters of sea level rise. Um, but then on the other axis, you have, you know, um, long-term planning, good politics, you know, integrated planning, you have transparency, you have community input, people having a voice at the table with government, uh, co-designing and collectively making decisions. You have politicians, you know, responsive to uh, its constituents' needs. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you, you have basically what we, what, we, what we see a lot of now. And we only found that in Louisiana's scenario, you know, A was the best case. And at that time, you know, the governor and the cabinet made a commitment to focus on governance around climate change and adaptation um, through that workshop. And, and so we've been working with all the state agencies through the Adaptive Governance Initiative. Uh, where we, um, we have a chief resilience officer and working with every state agency who has a resilience liaison. And we're walking through all the climate change impacts uh, and their vulnerabilities with them to start incorporating um, a new way of thinking into decision-making. Uh, and then we've also, you know, the, the, the development of the Climate Initiatives Task Force where Louisiana is gonna have its first climate action plan. Next slide. And so I'll just end with, um, you know, at the, the annual Smart Growth Summit, um, we've got great presentations from last year covering all of these topics um, and, and get ready for fall of 2021 because we'll, we'll, we'll also be having this conversation. Um, and that is, that's where I was gonna end, Maida. Okay. okay, I'm going to shift back to our PowerPoint. Um, well, the presentation's almost over. Um, so basically this is what um, I feel like we need to be doing. Um, the human dimension includes so much more than arts and culture, but arts and culture can have an important role in addressing the issues and help communities retain their sense of place even after relocating. So what do we need to do? We need to support the cultures of coastal Louisiana uh, we need to prepare the receiver communities, include cultural voices in planning, engage the arts and culture network, support artists to help people realize that this is a statewide issue. And we've mentioned some resources. I'm going to put these uh, links in, in the chat. For hey, Maida. Yes. Can you pull the PowerPoint into the screen share? Oh, dear. Um, so here are the resources um, that I mentioned, uh, that we mentioned during uh, the presentation. And I want to point out Shirley Laska's book, uh, Louisiana's Response to Extreme Weather. If you want to get more involved in, in understanding some of the cultural issues, um, she, she includes a lot of these in this book. There are ways to connect. Um, we have a um, there's the Louisiana Folklore Society. We have a Facebook group and you can sign up for email offerings. Um, I'll put this in the chat too. Uh, Our next, uh -huh. uh, someone has asked a question um, asking, will you send these, uh, this PowerPoint out to anyone that was um, registered for the workshop? Sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, well, actually this whole uh, presentation is gonna be put online. So you'll be able to, to see the whole presentation, not just the PowerPoint. Um, our next one is gonna be on artists and arts organizations that are addressing land loss. Some of them are already very involved in this and want to ask, uh, what would you do differently uh, if, you knew what you, if you knew then what you know now? Uh, so we'll be sending out that through the emails. 
And now um, we're going to close the PowerPoint and uh, Kelsey will uh, be leading, um, Kelsey and I will be leading the discussion, the questions. Yeah, so um, Mandy's gonna put all that contact information in the chat for us. And again, April's gonna be waiting for y'all's questions if anybody has one that they don't just wanna start off with. But we've got right at 30 minutes left, which is awesome. Should give us enough time to dive deeper into some of the topics. If we wanna, you know, if you have a question about Monique's overview of an artist response to this, of, you know, Charbriand's comments on intersectionality and how do we grapple with this and what comes next in that conversation. And especially with Camille and all she shared about how do we actually mitigate, how do we actually adapt at this point with the timelines that we've seen. And then I guess to me, the overarching theme is again, that arts and cultural network, that response to this. Um, so y'all feel free, I've been telling y'all to mute this whole time, but y'all feel free to unmute and somebody ask a question. Um, otherwise I'm gonna have to call on some names like my school teacher mother. Anyone want to go first? I have a question for Monique. Uh, I was very uh, interested in when you described all the different uh, native tribes uh, that whose ancestral lands you were on when you went up to Arnoville. And I'm participating in a lot of Zoom meetings where they ask you two things to identify in the beginning as your pronouns, but also whose ancestral land you're on currently. And they send a link out and it just basically says all of Southeast Louisiana, it just shows us Choctaw. And I know that's like so many more than that. Is there a resource that shows those lands in South Louisiana that we can be more accurate when we acknowledge those lands? Yeah, um, uh, I, I wish that I could point you to a website and maybe um, I should put that on my long list of things to do. Um, but I think that it's, you know, really important for us to remember that just as this place of South Louisiana is a hotspot of biodiversity, this was also and still is a place of extreme human diversity. And so just, you know, in the 100 mile radius that surrounds present day, you know, um, the colonial city of New Orleans, there were up to seven different languages that were spoken here, not to mention that this has been a fluid place of trade for a very long time. So, um, you know, even with the modern Homa, uh, that because of the disruptions of colonization and um, even American assimilation, um, you know, that the modern Homa are a mix of Biloxi, Shiramacha, Choctaw, um, and other tribes. So, um, you know, where Arnoville is, that's uh, primarily a Takapa Ishak territory, but also the Appaloosa were uh, and are not very far away. And so um, it, um, I don't have a direct place to direct you or direct site to direct you to but i think that it's important for us um in in louisiana to remember that um there are indigenous peoples who um who 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 still inhabit these territories and um and and also to 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 recognize the ancestors who were here before um, so I'm doing my own research. I mean, it was just a couple of years ago that I was like, well, bunch of, that's so much more interesting than calling a place New Orleans. And this place is still living up to that name, right? Like in 2019, before COVID shut the world down, New Orleans, Bulbuncha welcomed close to 20 million visitors. Um, so this is a place where people are still exchanging ideas and coming together um, um, on kind of a neutral ground. Um, so. Yes, I saw a presentation where you uh, mentioned Bulbuncha. It was the first time I'd ever heard that before. And it was like, oh, wow, something new. And it's, I'm glad you're promoting that <laughs> widely. So it, it's, it's, 
it's very important for us to know these ancestral lands. And, and I guess also that so many tribes migrated to here and didn't necessarily stay here, in, especially in coastal Louisiana and along the river and the byways, there was some was more migratory and transient. Is that the case too? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think that, you know, um, we've gotten so conditioned to think that the water is not our friend. Um, but what's really interesting, even when you go to colonial documents is, you know, I've been doing a bit of history research with my own family and it's like, oh, they're down in like Plaquemines Parish and then they're in Appaloosa, you know, and like that, that movement and that mobility because of water and how water, you know, really is a gift. We just have to learn to live with it and in a right relationship. I see that there's a hand raised. Yes, it's me, Harold Fonte. Shall I go go ahead and speak? Yes, Dally Forth, Harold. Oh yes, thank you very much. Well, first, thank you. I want to thank everybody about their uh, informative uh, presentation. We do have a question, but then I. Uh, don't, I want to make a comment. <laughs> uh, first question, uh, prior to the uh, issue of uh, global warming and climate change, we know, and the maps clearly show how so much of Louisiana's land loss was due to subsidence, which was uh, uh, exacerbated by oil drilling of uh, canals and so forth, which hastened land loss. So are there any is there an ongoing effort to uh, uh, mitigate the land loss due to or address subsidence specifically? That's my question. Um, Harold, that is really beyond the scope of what we're what we're doing. Um, there are others that that are addressing the physical coast, and what we're doing is addressing the cultural coast. Okay, well, thanks. Well, although there may be I have a short, I have a short answer you. for you. Oh, by all means. <laughs> um, I would uh, so the 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 state's master plan is is um, you know addressing building back land to reduce the impacts of subsidence, but uh, we are still conducting all of the practices that led to subsidence and are um, keeping perpetuating it. Oh, good, good, right, because I think this land loss thing has to be a multi-pronged effort. That's really my comment, because uh, naturally we're all concerned about uh, man-made global warming and so forth and how it contributes to the sea level, but uh, I don't think uh, just a, in terms of a worldwide perspective, we can't, that can't be our only means of addressing rising sea level, at least in Louisiana, subsidence has to be part of it. And uh, I don't want to see Louisiana sink. Nobody does. Uh, I certainly don't want Louisiana to get any warmer because our warm summers are long and hot enough as it is. But on a worldwide basis, we have to be very, very, I mean, thinking worldwide, globally here, I have to be very careful about our solutions because we know that worldwide, just to make a point, when traditional fossil fuels become more expensive too quickly, marginal people across the planet are kind of forced over the edge. Marginal people become poor and they resort to stuff like burning the woods, burning their furniture and burning cow patties to uh, stay stay warm and all those things do generate carbon dioxide so we have to be very careful in terms of the world's poor and uh one other reason for having caution is because and we're very blessed by this uh, the past models of uh, how fast the earth would warm up going back 20 30 40 years i'm very grateful that they have not panned out you know, they haven't come true. So uh, I think we have to be even handed is that's my comment that we all should be aware and careful about our solutions. So, yeah, thank you, Harold. And I, I think too, to your point, 
when we think about a global perspective, we're not the only people that are facing a, a cultural, you know, significant change. And so I think too, you know, with Maida in the work and, and Camille in the work and Char Brown in the work and Monique in the work, there's all these people in the state that are thinking this way. So that's, that's one of the tenets of these workshops is to try and get these people in a room, you know, at first it was in person and now digitally to try and, and talk about the cultural impact of this you know, when these, when these lands disappear and when these people have to migrate. Um, Can, Monique, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, I think that um, it is important for us to remember that our coastal master plan is dependent upon deep water oil and gas royalties from the Go Mesa, the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act that was passed years ago, where we are allocating those funds for coastal restoration projects. And to also say that the reason why we have real dollars at the present to go forward with projects is because of deep water horizon drilling disaster, you know, clean water finds, which is why they have these sediment diversions that they're able to kind of move move forward with. Um, so I think that you know it is important for us to recognize, um, you know, one like what are the situations, but two that there are corporate interest that are invested here along the, the coast and um, that South Louisiana has made the ultimate sacrifice for the benefit of multinational corporations and that shareholders are based in Europe and far beyond and that we are um, in many cases at the bottom of the list when it comes to quality of, of health um, and education and all of these things. So I think that you know we can't really separate um, all of those things. And we have to recognize also that these multinational corporations are also sponsoring cultural programming. You know, the biggest one to point to is that the Jazz and Heritage Festival is sponsored by Shell Oil. So I think that we, we do need to have an analysis of like what that means and what corporate accountability and responsibility is um, in, 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 in a place like South Louisiana and other places that are faced with these challenges. Thank you. Gwen, I thought I saw you unmute. Did you have a question or a comment? I did, but it's been answered. Okay. <laughs> it's been addressed. Thank you. I have a question. Um, Monique, I wanted to actually make offer an opportunity to you. I'm on the board of directors of the Abita Springs Trailhead Museum. And we have a little one room museum in the park here. And uh, you know, the, the heritage of our town is based on Choctaw culture. And I've been trying to find ways to support that and enlighten the, the locals uh, about the significance of that. And uh, maybe you could help with that process. We'd, we'd be happy to offer you the opportunity to come to speak when it feels like it's safe to do so and uh, show your work. I'm, I'm a big fan and uh, that'd be a great thing to, to see you here. Thanks, I love that. I'm also working with uh, Sierra Lagarde, who's from the Bayou Lacom Choctaw. Um, and we're doing a, um, we're supporting a network of indigenous gardens and talking about plants and um, sharing that knowledge too. So I, 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 I wrote your name down. And uh, if you wanna add your uh, email in the chat, I'd love to stay connected. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you for speaking up about that, George. David, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, I just want to uh, comment that um, as I put in the chat box, Monique's exhibit is here at Vermillionville in Lafayette right now. So if you want to come and check it out uh, and her her uh, movie, My Louisiana Love, is going to be uh, airing here on April 26th. And we will be honored to have Madame Verdun herself uh, in presence with us. So if you want to come down to Lafayette, uh, we got the best gumbo in Lafayette, probably the whole of South Louisiana. Uh, and that's scientific fact. That's not bragging. <laughs> so we, uh, all of this, uh, you know, I'm just fascinated by all this and I've, I've admired what, what Monique has been doing for years. Uh, and I think this is just uh, primordial uh, stuff we need to be talking about right now because uh, 
uh, there's so much going on right now that to preserve our, our heritage and our culture. Just a little bit about me, if you don't, uh, I know a lot of y'all. I can see a lot of my good friends out there. Even my cousin John Duce, I saw was on was online earlier. Um, but yeah, I mean that's that's what we're all about here at Vermillionville and by Vermillion District. You know, showing that link between the culture and the land and the water. Uh, I, I like what uh, I think what Monique said about uh, we've kind of forgot about the water. We considered our enemy. You know, we've turned our backs on the bayous. You know, that's one of the things that you know, I've, you know, grown up on Bayou Lafourche and now working on Bayou Vermilion here. This to get people to face the bayou once again. And I consider this constant flood threat, even though it's that. But that's you know, the, the bayou is going to do what the bayou is going to do. The Mississippi is going to do what it's going to do. We have to learn how to live with it. You know, and that's what I, we've you know, hopefully the lesson we learned from our native. Uh, American neighbors is that they learn to live with with all the um, the hardships that are associated with living this land, you know. And we've tried to engineer ourselves out of one problem by engineering ourselves into another problem. And I don't think we're going to continue to engineer ourselves out of these problems anymore because we're running out of solutions to some of these problems. But um, but yeah, I'm just you know encourage all everybody to continue this dialogue. It's very important, you know, uh, that we continue, you know, because because uh, I have three sons and none of whom live in, well, two of them don't even live in the United States, quite honestly, you know, and the third one doesn't live in the state of Louisiana. So I don't see a future for, you know, my, my descendants here in the state of Louisiana. I'll hang on as long as I can, but, you know, hopefully other people will be able to do that. Uh, but to get back to Balbocha also, that's, um, there's a lot of resources about that. I know Monique knows our, our good friend, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Darenberg. And if you don't know Jeffrey, you know, you're in for a treat. <laughs> He's quite the character and he has a little zine. He's put out a couple of uh, additions to it uh, called, called Balbutia. And it's, uh, it's you know, done by natives, area natives. And it's a very well done little zine that he, he puts together. And just one last thing I want to mention that he has an article coming out in Southern Cultures in the latest edition about uh, bison hunting. <laughs> but bison hunter at Costco also. So, uh, uh it's it's a great little article and, and jeffrey's a great a great friend of mine uh and a lot of people here so i just wanted to you know congratulate monique i look forward to toasting you here in vermilionville at the end of the month and i hope to see a lot of you there uh to come and see the movie because i've seen it before and it's so uh, it's a great movie and it's and it's worth seeing again so so thank you monique thank you david and david if you want to drop in the chat a link to that book or any of the other things you mentioned We'll make sure that we um, distribute those to some of the resources that people have shared in the chat. Anybody else have any more questions or thoughts about um, the role of the arts, creative placekeeping, any of that? We've got just a little bit of time left. Yeah. Hi, my name is Laura. I, I don't have my video on. <laughs> hey, Laura. There you are. Yeah. I have a question for uh, Dr. Sharbia. Um, I saw in your presentation that you are also an artist. So I was curious about your artistic practice or how that tied into your um, like academic research on this subject. So my, uh, that's a really good question. My practice is a bit layered in that um, there's a lot of work that I do that's very participatory. So not necessarily like a, a designated end goal. Um, I work with fiber and textiles a lot. That's actually my my big like passion medium that I'm really deeply involved with. Um, it connects more so to cultural memory and less around land loss. Although I feel like part of kind of my overarching interest is with how um, women of color, whether it's black women in the South, folks in the global South, et cetera, kind of use textiles, et cetera, as this vehicle for cultural memory, um, passing on knowledge and whatnot, but even sort of expanding this notion of fibers and what's considered fibrous. So in me returning back home, I moved back home last year. Um, I've been getting really deep into just Spanish moss very randomly. It was, um, yeah, it was a very strange sort of like, pathway back to it but it in itself is a fiber and so like I've been sort of playing around with manipulating it and how it could be used um whether it's for weaving purposes or stitching purposes but um my own sort of personal practice really ties into just figuring out creative responses to things like this so if we were in person I probably would not have like 
sat and spoken with y'all, but we probably would have like co-created an installation or I would have made prompts that we could respond to um, and utilize creatively. But then I also combined kind of like quilting, embroidery, et cetera, um, to create imagery messages and things that go back to that point earlier about sort of amplifying our histories and our stories. So that's a little bit about me, but I created artwork that accompanied my dissertation. It was a manifesto um, that sort of looked at the kind of life and world that I wanted to shape for myself, for those who will come after me. Um, and that work continues to, um, but yeah, that's kind of my practice in a nutshell. I don't know that there's a one-to-one -one correlation with this subject versus um, besides like the work I do with textiles, everything else is very much me utilizing whatever I feel kind of best conveys the message that I'm trying to get across at the time. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Yeah, thank you for that question, Laura. We actually got a, a question via email. It asked about um, just while we have everybody still on the call and the couple minutes we have left, um, just the thought process around how art or arts organizations, cultural entities can, ha is there a concrete evident impact on dealing with climate change and environmental impact? Um, so I don't know if Maida or Camille um, or Monique Charbrion, if anybody else on the Zoom wants to, to touch on that one, I'm gonna stay quiet on that one to hear what everybody else has to say before I pop in. Kelsey, would you say the question again? I wasn't quite sure I caught it. Yeah, so asking around, is there anything that's historic or contemporary where there's a, a concrete case that an artist or the arts or an arts and cultural organization have made, you know, a big, a positive impact on dealing with climate change and with environmental impacts? Um, I, I have, I have a, a couple, well, one, I will say that, um, elsewhere in the world, there are some really big, um, initiatives occurring, integrating artists into the design of, of the built environment and the future of communities. Um, there are some examples that I can, can send along with you. We had, um, a gentleman from New York at our summit uh, two years ago who, uh, Jamie Bennett, um, talked about um, um, they're actually giving, integrating um, resources for artists into all of the public participation and design of, of uh, big planning efforts happening in various parts across the United States. And, and the outcomes are, are pretty um phenomenal. I mean, just the way that the built environment is able to be uh, thought of completely differently when you have artists part of the conversation. Um, and, and not just about um, design of community, but also the programming of community. And I think that's a really, really, um, uh, so th this is, you know, something that's, that's advancing. Um, I think a concrete piece that needs to happen is, is that um, budget for participation and integration of artists needs to occur in all public, um, public expenditures uh, involving new infrastructure and the, the build out of, of the community. Um, this is something we, we've been pushing for a long time. A lot of times you, you know, you get a, there's a contract that goes out and it's all on planning or, or design, um, but there's there's no you know there's not a budget allocated for the integration of community and uh, artists um, to 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 be included in that. Uh, and then as in terms of climate change, I think that one of the the biggest challenges we have with climate change is that we're not we have to essentially. <laughs> Um, reimagine how we live, how we do everything. And so um, I feel like before we're able to even get there, there has to be a narrative. And a narrative is, is, is so much more um, meaningful when it's based on truth and people and culture and identity and, and um, all of that is formed through arts. And so I, I think that artists play a really um, important role in helping define the narrative uh, in addition to the solutions, but obviously there has to be resources allocated uh, for that inclusion, so. 
And I, I just wanted to hop in and say we our first workshop was actually for artists, regional arts councils, cultural districts. It was more a tighter focused group of arts and arts organizations. And Meta actually had wonderful examples of artists that are currently in the state that are that are doing this type of work. So um, if if y'all are interested, I know that she'd be more than happy to share some of those examples. And the one that we love to talk about because we actually brought him to Louisiana is Xavier Cortada is an eco artist out of Miami. Um, definitely somebody to look at in terms of an artist who encourages other artists to assume their role in their community and to help, you know, to Camille's point, translate this conversation, to have that consistency in the conversation and to do what only, you know, arts and culture bears can do, which is to show people how to see things in a new way. Um, but yeah, so Meta had, in, in our scratching kind of for these workshops, we she's come across a, a ton of artists that are doing this type of work in the state. So it gives us hope. Yeah, and I just wanted to add that a Studio in the Woods, which is a program through Tulane University, um, has just been really centering these conversations and and welcoming artists to, you know, to to dive in um, in ways that um, have been super inspiring and have led to more conversations and connections. Fabulous. Um, we We've got about three minutes. Did I hear somebody? Yeah, I wanted to share really quickly back to your question about, um, I was sitting here like looking tires, tirelessly trying to find the um, the name, but there was a woman named Lisa Hoffman who used to run McCall Center, who now runs Alliance for Artist Communities, but is a scientist by training. And um, I will try my best to find it, but if you if folks were to look up McCall Center when they had their sort of visual arts environmental artists in residence program, there were folks who were coming into Charlotte who were looking at ways to respond to certain needs, whether it was native planting, all sorts of other things, and really combine both like environment, ecology, et cetera, and art to create things that could be these living, breathing structures that were embedded within their local community. And there's an artist who came through New Orleans and I will try my best to remember her name and find it and get it to you. Um, but she did a lot of work around um, like creating sort of like various water solutions and things responding to like flooding that could be woven using natural materials. I can't remember it now, but I know she was at McCall too. And McCall Center was a residency program that specifically had a focus for that, that um, had come, folks coming in to do some really interesting sort of responses um, to environmental issues. So that might be a resource. Awesome, thank you. Well, Maida, you feel like we're at a close? Yeah, I think so. Um, again, we, we want to continue the conversation. We want to have different themes um, uh, and continue, you know, continue the dialogue. And um, again, there there are no easy answers, but I, but there are things that we can do. For example, when we talk about um, uh, receiving communities and the the. Um, sometimes there are clashes between the, the long term residents and the newcomers. Well, there are very specific strategies that you can use um, to um, help work pe help people work through those things. And as models, you can look at all the immigrant groups, all the strategies that they use to retain their culture in a, in a new new land. Um, what you know, whether they're coming far or um, or around from around the world, there are definitely strategies uh, that can help conserve your culture. And so I just want people to just really start thinking about this more intentionally, because I think intention is so much of what we need now, because I know with the French language, there are a lot of grandchildren and great grandchildren saying, I wish y'all had taught me French. Um, and the, so, you know, I'm going to leave you with the question, what would your, what will your great grandchildren wish we had done? <laughs> <laughs>